the king has returned. Oversimplified is back. We were all stunned a couple hours ago when he announced through social media posts that the first two episodes of the Second Punic War were coming out uh, and that he was working on the third. I didn't realize that within an hour or two of that announcement, the video would premiere. And so here we are. Uh, a couple of things before we get started into this. Uh, if you're new to the channel, and I am guess many of you are discovering me for the first time, while the title says reaction, I really pride myself more on doing commentary, breaking it down, giving additional details and information, and when needed, researching some things to find out a little more. I am not an expert on the Punic Wars. This is not my area of expertise. Those are other parts of history, but I'm excited to dive into this. I'm excited for us to all learn together. Uh, a couple of things I ask you to do. Number one, please make sure you watch the original content on his channel without my commentary. Whether you do it, whether you've already done it, which I'm trusting you have, or you do it after you watch this. We want to make sure that we support our original content creators so that they have the incentive to keep making these videos. And I know that everyone loves Oversimplified. So the link's in the description to the original content. That's one thing. The other thing I want to say as we dive into this is just to set the stage a little bit. This is one of the most famous wars in history because this pits against each other two of the more famous military commanders in history. On the Roman side, you've got Scipio Africanus. On the uh, Carthaginian side, we're going to have Hannibal. And I know there's a, a new series coming out about Hannibal with Denzel Washington in that role. Um, at this point, Carthage is most of the northern part of Africa bordering the Mediterranean, and a good chunk of what is today Spain. Rome at this point is really pretty much Italy. Uh, it's most of the Iberian Peninsula. It's not even northern Italy, and then it's the islands there, uh, Corsica and Sardinia. Uh, and this is a time when it could be a turning point in history. Carthage wins these wars. Maybe we're not talking about the Roman Empire the same way. Maybe it's the Carthaginians. So this is a huge, huge moment with some really bigger-than-life characters, so I'm excited to see how he presents this. Let's dive in. This video was made possible of course it by is. NordVPN. Click the link below and get an exclusive deal with four extra months. Also, check out the merch store for some new character pins, the last remaining bucket plushies, and even a calendar. And I'm not done yet. We've partnered with u nice. to bring you an exclusive oversimplified Roman console figure. Love Get it. Get it while you can at oversimplified.u2s.com. But it's limited edition. So once it's gone, it's gone. So go and buy it now. Hey, what are you still doing here? I said go and buy it now! Our beloved mercenaries, let's hear it. <laughs> okay. Thank you one and all for your hard work fighting in the First Punic War. Would have been nice if you'd won, maybe tried a little harder, but this isn't the finger pointing convention. I know you all have one thing on your minds. Hey, when are we all getting paid? <laughs> So yeah, if you didn't see the First Punic War, I'll put a link down in the description as well as up at the end of this video so you can go back and watch my reaction to that. Remember you lost your... Okay. Jim, why don't you tell them? Jim. I'm not telling them. You tell them. Ugh. Look, you're not getting paid. What? We lost the First Punic War and owe the Romans a ton of reparations. Of course we can't pay you in full. And not only that, but this is a time in history when... Armies didn't necessarily get like regular pay, like a job that you would go to. Uh, you know, a lot of where their pay comes from is from victories. It's from looting. It's from enslaving the other side when you defeat them. Uh, and so if you're not successful on the battlefield, this is an incentive to be successful because success on the battlefield is how you make sure that you get rewarded for winning uh, and for fighting in the first place. Let's burn this place to the ground! Hey, hey! Don't burn this place to the ground. Come on, fellas. Will killing us really make you feel better about your money? Uh, yes. Yeah, probably would. Way to go, sir. Shut up, Jim. You're fired. I guess that makes two of us. Huh? Oh, man. Nice. The elephants are coming. In the aftermath of the First Punic War, Carthage's disgruntled mercenaries, left unpaid for all their hard work, revolted, and Carthage found itself caught up in an extremely destructive mercenary war. 
That's the tricky part when you are hiring people whose job it is to be professional soldiers and you don't follow through on the whole reason that they were willing to fight for you in the first place. They're not fighting for you because they believe in your cause. They're fighting for you for the reward of it. You don't give it to them. They got no problem turning on you. There's no loyalty there. The panicked Carthaginians hired more mercenaries to fight the mercenaries they couldn't afford to pay. And Carthage came dangerously close to collapse. All the while, across the water, there was Rome. Ha! Look at those morons. We just kicked their ass in the first Punic War, and now their own mercenaries are revolting. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Wait, first Punic War? Do you mean there's going to be a second one? Well, we're definitely taking advantage of this situation. So almost certainly, yes. The Romans did in fact. And this is an understandable thing to do. If you've got an enemy that at some point, even though you've just defeated them, they're still a powerful enemy, and they're still a threat, and they're still someone that you have to worry about long term. And I should, I'm should i noticing on the map here that they've got Sardinia and Corsica marked as being Carthaginian. I was thinking at the start of the Punic Wars that they were Roman already, but maybe not. Um, you absolutely have to take advantage of this if he's got infighting. You've got to do anything you can to reduce the potential of him coming back at you down the road when he has a chance to regather his strength. Fact, take advantage of the situation. Amongst the chaos, rebels on the Carthaginian island of Sardinia sent out a cry for help to uh -huh. Rome. Hot diggity dog, said the Romans. That's free real estate. And so in, they went. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's our island. Get the hell off. Hey, they requested our help. We're simply helping. Oh, no, you don't. Look, we're sending our own army to deal with the rebels, okay? But just to be clear, we're not trying to start a fight with you, so... You know, don't declare war on us or anything. War. <laughs> we surrender. Great. And you had to. part of the peace treaty, we get to keep these islands. There you go. Okay, so that's why when I said they were before, that they were part of the, uh, Rome before. Uh, and it's interesting because these are islands that are going to go back and forth over the years. And then later France is going to get involved. And, of course, that northern of those two islands is Corsica, where you're going to get Napoleon Bonaparte someday. No! The Carthaginians were hopping mad. As if their humiliating loss in the First Punic War wasn't bad enough, the Romans now took advantage of their mercenary problem and stole their island. Pulling islands. a Mission Impossible. Shocking I love it. Grab was pretty hard to justify, even by Roman standards. Additionally, the Romans now demanded Carthage pay them even more money on top of what was already owed. It if we've learned anything from history, it's that you can go too far with demanding reparations. Reparations are one thing, but when you try to take too much, you can end up creating more enemies you didn't have. And not even in reparations. Sometimes look at the American Revolution, which was born out of uh, people feeling that they were being taxed unnecessarily without representation uh, in what is really essentially reparations paid to their own government for their defense in the French and Indian War. If Rome was trying to make Carthage as mad as possible, they were doing a fantastic job. And I, I got to think that the Roman thought process here is that Carthage is in no position to deny us. They're so weak. They've got so much infighting that what are they going to do? What's the worst case scenario here? They can't raise an army and come after us. That's what they got to be thinking. Seeds of a second Punic War were being sown and they were being watered with Carthaginian tears. Resentment in Carthage only continued to grow. Eventually, Carthage solved their mercenary problem thanks to Carthaginian military genius and hero of the First Punic War, Hamilcar Barca. He sorted those naughty mercenaries out with some good old-fashioned atrocities. Crucifixion. And it can't be a oversimplified video without at least one image of someone being spanked over someone's knee. And the destructive mercenary war was over. Still, all was not well in Carthage. Mere decades ago, they were the top dogs in the Western Mediterranean. Now, after the crushing defeat in the First Punic War and a huge bill to pay the Romans, Carthage was well and truly under Rome's thumb. War is such a uh, high-risk, high-reward thing to get into. Because if you win, you've got a potential to vastly grow your empire. And that's how Rome did it, right? They conquered these, these countries over the next couple of centuries after this. They conquered these groups of people, these various tribes, and then they assimilate them into the Roman Empire. And they were able to do that for centuries. Uh, but 
if you lose, now you're out a bunch of money and you gain nothing for it, and now you deal with the possibility of infighting. So it's high risk, high reward. <laughs> what on earth were they supposed to do? If they wanted any chance at regaining their former strength, there was one thing they needed now, more than anything, money. But as long as they owed Rome a bazillion dollars, there was nothing so they we're gonna could find do. It. Fortunately for them, amongst their ranks, there was one big hunk of a man with one big clump of a brain. <laughs> Me! Hamilcar Barca! Yes! Wait, why do you all have the exact same voice? <laughs> I have it too! That's right. Hero of the First Punic War, greatest general alive, and the poster above my bed, Hamilcar Barca had an idea. All right, we need money? Well, I've got one word for you. Spain. An area filled with lucrative silver mines from which the silver would flow like a river and our pockets would be stuffed, like Tony's mother at a buffet. Hey! So here's my proposal. What the hell? You send me with an army to Spain. I'll expand our territory, get those silver mines up and running, and we'll be able to pay the Romans back in no time. Okay. It's a good but move. Just to check, you're not secretly raising the money to go on a bloodthirsty revenge spree against Rome, are you? Because we can't afford that. Hanno, my dear, I'm simply going to pay them back. Well, that wasn't reassuring. Few in Carthage were as bitter about their loss in the First Punic War as Hamilcar Barca. 98% of his brain matter had been reallocated to thoughts of revenge. He was also fed up with the Carthaginian politicians. They're, play he deemed <laughs> They're playing Catan. I love it. Cowardly betrayal when they surrendered at the end of the last war. And so for Hamilcar, going to Spain meant being able to act independently from the weak Carthaginian government. Building. I can't help but notice some parallels here with Julius Caesar two centuries later, who goes off to fight the Gauls and, you know, he's been involved in politics in Rome and he comes from a, a prominent family and he goes off to fight the Gauls and kind of carves out this place for himself and builds a name for himself and, and glory and everybody singing his praises. And now he comes back the conquering hero his own strength, and then perhaps somewhere down the line, revenge. However, he wasn't going to Spain by himself. Hannibal? Yep. Yes, father? Would you like to come with me to build an empire in Spain? Oh boy, would I? Barbara, mind if I take our nine-year-old son with me? I want to implant an intense hatred of Rome in him and prepare him for a glorious campaign of vengeance. <sighs> Just try not to traumatize him, dear. No promises. The young boy Hannibal would accompany his father, watching learning boy you see that city over there yes father that is rome do you know what we do to romans no father we hate them hannibal we hate them with every fiber of our being it's so important and, and it's harder for figures of history from over two thousand years ago to know a lot beyond what they themselves in many cases have left behind for us but uh, it's so important in understanding the motivation of figures in history to study their backstory, to understand, you know, we do it with movies today, right? We love to see the Batman backstory and why he became who he was because of the trauma he experienced as a child with his parents being murdered in front of him and wanting to deal with all of that. And, and all of us in our lives are the product of our upbringing and our trauma and our experiences and all those sorts of things. And Hannibal and anyone else in history is no different. But why, Father? Can't I just play with my Digimons? No, son! They took everything from us. Our land, our wealth, our pride. Those animals. I'll tear them limb from limb. I'll burn their pathetic city to the ground. Dad? <laughs> I'm sorry, son. I've, I've just never been so proud. Keep going. I'll slaughter their people. <laughs> I'll cut off their faces and wear them as masks. <laughs> I love you, son. After taking Hannibal to the Temple of Baal and having him swear an oath never to be a friend of Rome, off dad and son went for their lovely beach holiday in Spain. But Spain was already inhabited by many tribes people. And when Hamilcar suddenly showed up in their territory, they were like, hey, who the hell are you? What are you doing here? I'm teaching my son how to become a warrior like me. Aw, well, that's sweet. Well then, little guy, uh, let's see what you got. Good boy. 
That was As hardcore, and they tasted the blood. The tribes of Iberia and expanding Carthaginian influence, Hannibal became a child of war, even earning battle scars from a young age. So this is not a bad idea if you're the Carthaginians. We have lost this war against a, a power that's pretty equal to us in Rome. Uh, so let's go build our strength and build our wealth on people who are weaker than us and build some additional strength, kind of build the foundation a little bit. Give yourself more areas to pull manpower from, to pull wealth from, to pull supplies from, build up that infrastructure, so to speak, and give yourself a better chance in the next war against the Romans. And he grew to become a great military leader himself, making his father very proud. I love you so much, son. Dad, not in front of the enemy. <laughs> you killed that guy so well, son. The Barcas successfully consolidated Carthaginian power, got those silver mines up and running, and were sending buckets of cash back there to a money-starved Carthage. And symbolizing Carthage's regrowing strength, a beautiful new city would eventually be founded in Spain. New Carthage, with a magnificent palace at its <laughs> the center. Elephant's dancing. Carthage is back, baby! What in the name of Apollo is going on here? Romans flowing silver mines dancing elephants. What are you up to Hamilcar? I'm simply gathering the money to pay you back. Oh well, Okay, then pay you or back are you rebuilding strength to go on a bloodthirsty revenge spree Like I said Claudius, I'm simply trying to pay you back. I like how he is using that play on words of pay you back, which can have multiple meanings to demonstrate what's going on here, where they're supposed to be paying them back, but they're planning to pay them back. It's really it's pretty smart on his part to put it together this way. Aw, you guys are hugging. <laughs> no, we're not. I was. I was hugging. <laughs> Hamilcar had practically carved out a kingdom for himself in Spain, free from the meddling Carthaginian yep. politicians. His power was becoming immense. But dad, yes, my son? I'm confused. Are we really simply paying the Romans back? We're not going to go on a bloodthirsty revenge spree? Of course we are. I'm just saying that to get the Romans off our backs. Listen, here's the most important life lesson I have for you. Vengeance is everything. An all-encompassing thirst for vengeance is great for your mental health. And here's the thing, too, is that here's the, the temptation when you are someone like Hamilcar and you've built this kind of fiefdom for yourself over on the Iberian Peninsula where there's a lot of wealth and there's a lot of comfort. It would be tempting in that situation to say, you know what, I know I wanted to get the Romans back, but this is a whole lot better life than going to war with the Romans. And so the question becomes... How important is this to him that he's willing to go away from the the safety and the uh, kind of distance he has from the meddling forces back in Carthage and just say, you know what, forget Rome. I'm just going to stay here and live out my days. Are you still confused? No, no, I get it now. But what if the Romans find out what we're up to? They won't find out. Why? Well, Hannibal, because I Nord VPN Nord VPN. There it is. <laughs> Knew that was coming. I'm confused again. Do you like your computer being hacked, all your passwords being stolen, and used to create a fake virtual you who drains your mom's bank account? Me Let me say, just yesterday, someone set up an AT&T phone account in my name, ordered a new iPhone 15, and had it sent to my old address that I haven't lived at in more than six years. So. I get it. Me neither. And that's why I use NordVPN. These days, hackers are only getting smarter, while you're only getting dumber. Whether it's convincing phishing attacks, fake Wi-Fi networks, or clicking your aunt's Facebook post that opens the door to a hacker party on your device, you need to protect yourself from online threats with NordVPN. NordVPN allows you to connect to secure servers that encrypt your data and keeps you safe by blocking malicious websites with their threat protection feature. With NordVPN, you can also connect to other territories and take advantage of better deals or content not available in your country. And if you don't like it, it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. 
So go to nordvpn.com slash oversimplified to get an exclusive deal with a huge discount and four extra months. That's nordvpn.com slash oversimplified. And as always, you'll be supporting my channel. So thank you. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah. Carthaginian Tears, a child of war and the Carthaginian conquest of Spain. The Carthaginian recovery had been staggeringly quick, and Rome was seriously alarmed. But they were also preoccupied with ongoing wars elsewhere, including an expansionist war to the north, where they were enslaving thousands of northern Celts. So for now, to keep Carthage... So anytime you hear that term Celts, and I, I paused on a really blurry okay. scene there, um, Celts is kind of almost like a catch-all term, almost like barbarians in some ways. Uh, within the Celts, there are a lot of different groups that you're going to hear about. You know, the Gauls and the the Belgae and and all these the you know groups. Celts we traditionally associate with places like Ireland or Scotland, but uh, a lot of what what is today Austria, they were Celts. Uh, so when you're talking about Celts, realize it's a catch-all term that refers to a lot of different, very, very varying degrees of types of people. The Romans insisted on a new treaty. See this river. The two sides agreed that everything above it was in Rome's sphere of influence, while beneath it was Carthage. Under no Interesting, because this is very similar to what you're going to see centuries later with other types of agreements. For example, the line of demarcation that kind of creates the Portuguese sphere of influence in what is today Brazil versus the rest all becoming Spanish in South America. Circumstances were the Carthaginians to expand north of that river. But for now, Hamilcar and son were living it up. Well, son, here's to many more years of successful campaigning in Spain. Now, if you'll excuse me, I just have to go fight those guys. See you later, son. I love you. <gasps> what the? Oh, crap. I drowned? Oh, well. Always remember, son. You are vengeance. <laughs> Also, delete my browsing history. Hamilcar Barca <laughs> was tragically ambushed at a river and drowned. His son-in-law, and possibly also his lover, no further questions, took charge for a while. But he too was later assassinated, leaving finally a 26-year-old Hannibal in charge of the Carthaginian armies in Spain. Sources say the men readily accepted him as their leader. He chose to suffer the same hardships as his men. He lived in the same conditions, was often the first into battle and the last one out. And this is a great way to prove yourself because they've initially given you this position or you've, you've got this position and they're throwing their support behind you for that position. Uh, so you've got some goodwill there, kind of like a honeymoon period. Now you've got to earn it. You've got to prove that they were right to put their trust in you. And by leading from the front so to speak you're gonna in you know build a lot of goodwill and get men to fight for you in ways you might not otherwise be able to uh, napoleon was really good at this as well and it also helped that he looked a lot like his dad he had the total respect of his men if he said jump they said how high if he said tuck me in they said how tight if he said talk to a girl without peeing your pants they said that's impossible. Nobody can do that. An army that would follow him anywhere would be crucial yeah. for exacting his vengeance against Rome. Hannibal's army had become a strong and loyal fighting swole, force. brother. We got... and... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Hannibal. We've got a Hulk Hogan on the wall for that one. And this is one of the great things about Oversimplified and, and definitely why it's worth watching his videos a couple of times through because there's always so much going on that there are things you're going to miss in the background the first time. It reminds me a lot of Monty Python in that way. His army had become a strong and loyal fighting force and that was making a certain nation very uncomfortable. Seeing Carthage re-strengthened so quickly was not something Rome had expected. Yet here they were, paying off their debts and expanding their territory. It didn't feel very much like Carthage was under Rome's thumb at all, mm. and Rome wanted to put an end to it. Tensions were strung tighter than your liar's g-string, and all it would take was one incident to trigger all-out war. And in 219 BC, 
a city in Spain would find itself at the very center of that fateful incident, Segunda. Remember that treaty declaring everything south of this river to be Carthage's sphere of influence? Well, Saguntum should therefore obviously be Carthaginian, right? Wrong! Saguntum had actually scored itself an informal alliance with Rome after Rome had helped it with an internal dispute. With Carthaginian encroachment, Saguntum began to fear for its independence. So anytime we're talking about history, we love to have decisive moments that we point to. The stock market crash caused the Great Depression. The assassination of Franz Ferdinand caused World War I. But these are trigger events that are often only trigger events because of many years of other things that have been building under the surface, just waiting for something to make it trigger the next phase. So while Saguntum is what we can point to, it can't be the cause. It is just uh, the, the spark that lights this. And Rome declared itself Saguntum's protector. But this clearly went against the Ebro River Treaty. So what on earth was Rome doing? Were the Saguntines and the Romans truly just BFFs? <laughs> it's possible. Or was Rome deliberately trying to interfere with Hannibal's Spanish expansion and maintain a staging post for a future war with Carthage? More likely. And Hannibal certainly viewed this rome saguntum alliance as an outrage. Yet another example of Roman arrogance. At first, he left Saguntum alone. But having learnt from his father to hate all things Roman and having inherited his father's dream of bringing Rome to its knees more and more, Hannibal may have begun to see Saguntum as an opportunity. And this is where your upbringing matters because if he had been raised in a different way to see the Romans much more favorably, then there's more of a chance that he's going to look for a diplomatic solution or that he's going to leave it alone or he's going to just assume the best, that Rome's not really up to no good, this is just kind of an exception and we should just allow it. Uh, your background, your biases, it's all going to come into play in how you choose to respond to things like this. Could this controversial alliance be just what devilish little Hannibal needed to kickstart a second war with Rome and restore Carthaginian dominance. It's even possible that Rome were also using Saguntum to goad Hannibal into a fight so they could go and kick him out of Spain. And as the two giants began gearing up for round two, the poor people of Saguntum had no idea that they were about to be crushed in the collision. They're ground zero. Hey, your alliance with Saguntum is an insult, and we won't stand for it. They're our friends, Hannibal. And if you lay a finger on them, it'll be an act of war. Yeah, Hannibal. Back the hell off. War, eh? I was thinking I might just besiege their city and massacre their people. I hope you do, Hannibal. Find out what happens. Yeah, we hope you Mess do. Mess around Hannibal. and find well, out. Maybe I will. Go ahead. Kill them all. Uh, okay, then. Fine. Fine. Okay, guess I'll do just that. Consul? We look forward to it. Consul? You're going to protect us, though, right, Consul? Consul! Now here's a situation where if you're Rome, you've got a couple of options. These are our friends. We protect them. Uh, we fight Carthage. Or we back off and one of two things happens. Carthage wins and we have a causus belli. We have a reason to go to war with them. Or we don't lose our people and we just say, okay, you know what? We were going to give it to you anyway. And we just kind of let it be at that. Down, no. To top it all off, when the Saguntine people made the genius decision of raiding into Carthaginian Oops. territory, enough was enough. Yeah. In an action that was guaranteed to provoke the Romans into war, Hannibal besieged the city. The siege of Saguntum lasted eight cruel months before Hannibal broke through the city defenses and turned Saguntum into a killing field. And this is what happens when you have sieges at this time in history. If the city surrenders, very often you'll have a chance to save the civilians inside. Uh, not always, but very often. If you hold out, especially you hold out for eight months, you can guarantee that in the event that the besieging army breaks through, they're going to slaughter everybody. It was a massacre. What the hell? T 
Tell me I didn't just catch you massacring our friends, the Sugantees. Well, Consul, if you like the Sugantees so much, perhaps you should suck on these nuts. So I had to pause there for a couple of reasons. Number one, because I was laughing a little too much at that joke. I, I am still just a teenage boy on the inside. Uh, but secondly, because my hard drive actually ran out of space while I was recording, so I had to clean some stuff up. Let's continue. <laughs> Hearing word of the attack on Saguntum, Rome was understandably in an uproar, and all eyes were now fixated on what would happen next as Rome sent a delegation to Carthage, led by one of the most highly esteemed Roman senators, Fabius Maximus. He what an awesome demanded name. an answer for Hannibal's sins. All right, listen up, scum. You've got a rogue general in Spain attacking a Roman ally. What are we supposed to do about it? Well, there shouldn't have even been a Roman ally in Spain. You're the aggressor here. Hand Hannibal over to us as a criminal so we can punish him severely. No, yes, no, yes. no. That's a uh, reference to earlier oversimplified videos too. Uh, in particular, the guy with the funny mustache whose father f would often punish him severely. Look, I hold in the folds of my toga both peace and war. Which one should I let drop? Whichever one you, you did really want, say that. Then I choose. The Second Punic War had begun. All of that by way of introduction, but it's so important to understand all of the backstory in order to understand the war itself. So often we we love to study the wars, the battles, the tactics, the the generals, but we miss out on so much incredible backstory that leads to these events, the economic situations, the political, the the cultural significance of things, the territorial significance. Pack it up, boys. We've got them. We already destroyed these clowns once, and we were the underdogs. Now, we're the overdogs? Hot dogs. Exactly. This is going to be E-Z. Here's the plan. Consul Longus, you take your army and sail straight for Carthage. Burn that city to the ground. And Consul Scipio, you just head on over to Iberia and make sure this Hannibal guy doesn't do anything crazy. Scipio and Hannibal. I mean, this is one of the all-time great showdowns of two of the greatest military minds in history going head-to-head. -head. Uh, and it wasn't even thought of as being the main event. And how many times has this happened in history? Look at, again, Napoleon in Italy was the sideshow to what was supposed to be the main event up north with the Army of the Rhine. And Napoleon turned the sideshow into the main event. I mean, what's he going to do? Cross the Alps? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to what? Cross the Alps. We're going to what? I just told you. Hannibal will freeze to death. Trust me, Jerome. The Romans are expecting us to fight the same way we did last time. Passively. Taking no initiative. They think it's going to be E Z. And this is a fair thought process on Hannibal's part, especially if you are a very overconfident young guy who has been building up their strength and you want to test out the new toy, so to speak, which is the new, the new and improved Carthage. It makes sense to want to do this. So this time, we have to be aggressive. We have to go on the attack. It sickens me to say this, but this time, we have to be a little more Roman. <gasps> you mean we're going to yeah. take poops and baths together? But I'm insecure about my hairy legs. No, I'm saying this time, we're going to take the fight to them. Think about it. Rome thinks they're simply going to invade us and win the war. So when they suddenly find themselves being invaded from the north, They'll freak out. This is where it's important to understand your enemy, to learn from your enemy and what he has done well, and then perfect it for yourself. Like Tony's mother, when the buffet runs out of shrimp. Hey! I got to admit, it's actually kind of genius. And my hairy legs will insulate me from the cold. That's the spirit. Hannibal, you have my sword and my spear and my legs. Ugh. Hannibal's Little Lord of the Rings reference. daring alpine trek to surprise the Romans was a bold but risky strategy. 
If it paid off, he could catch the Romans with their pants down, but he could also end up losing a ton of men and supplies yep. in the hostile mountain conditions. Nevertheless, in 218 BC, with a fire in his eyes and some vengeance in his belly, mm. Hannibal brought his force of almost 100,000 men across the Ebro River. They spent months on the road, trekking through the cold, hostile mountain conditions. And when they finally reached the other side, they said, Hooray! We did it! We crossed the Alps. How many got left? Those were the Pyrenees. Oh. <laughs> Those are the Alps. After crossing the Pyrenees, the army then had to pass through southern Gaul, a vast territory filled with tribespeople, many of whom were yep. hostile to Hannibal's presence. His journey to the Alps was an ordeal in itself, as he was forced to fight his way through and incurred pretty hefty losses before even reaching the mountains. And this is why so often when people talk about advancing armies that have huge advantages, I think the American Civil War, people always talk about, well, the Union had such incredible advantages in manpower uh, and supplies. That's true. But you also have a huge disadvantage of mar marching across hundreds of miles of territory through hostile land. You've got to protect supply and communication lines in many cases. In this case, he's probably living off the land, but it's hard to feed 100,000 men off the land, especially when you're surrounded by enemy territory. This is not an easy thing to do, even with a big army. His plan was almost stopped in its tracks entirely as the Roman consul Scipio, on his way to Iberia, discovered Hannibal was right on his doorstep. Suddenly, Hannibal's journey became a race as he rushed to get his massive army across the vast Rhone River before the Romans could intercept him. The crossing was chaotic with the panicking elephants causing several men to drown. And the first combat of the war occurred when small scouting parties from each side encountered one another. When Scipio finally caught up to Hannibal's position, what he found was an empty Carthaginian camp. Hannibal. And this is one of the things that Julius Caesar a couple centuries later is going to be phenomenal at is his ability to move troops and do engineering marvels with getting across rivers and building fortifications and uh, and being able to live off the land and do so while moving quickly with a big force. Hannibal had slipped through his fingers. The Roman consul Scipio felt the weight of the situation. Quite unbelievably, Hannibal was going to cross the Alps into Italy, and the Romans had no idea where he would emerge. For the first time, a Carthaginian force had the Roman homeland under threat. Scipio sent his men onto Iberia as planned, but he himself rushed home to raise a new army so that if Hannibal survived the crossing, Scipio would be there. This is actually a pretty smart move. Why attack him now? If you know he's headed for Italy, if you know he's headed toward Rome and he's got to go through the Alps, why not let Mother Nature do its job and let attrition take its toll? Even if they do survive the crossing, they're going to come through probably weak, undersupplied, probably exhausted, a lot of death and disease. It's the perfect plan. Waiting. Would you look at that, boys? We're here. The Alps! Although it is a little later than I expected. Uh-oh. Yeah, it's kind of chilly. We'll set up camp here and wait for spring, right? It's way too cold, right? Hannibal? Hannibal's famous crossing of the Alps was brutal. It was already autumn, and the men suffered terribly. It was cold. Men would fall off the sides of icy cliffs. They starved. They fell off the sides of icy cliffs. Some sources say they had to eat their pack animals and would finish off dying comrades in order to take their clothes for extra warmth. And then they would fall off the sides of icy cliffs. Imagine an army of 50,000 men with all of their horses, supplies, and 37 elephants trying to navigate the most hostile mountain range in Europe. And it wasn't just nature that they were up against. Tribes people lived in the mountains, yeah. and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. People that understood how to live there and could operate in small groups and do hit-and-run tactics. A tribe approached Hannibal and said, Hey man, geez, that's some nice armor. What is that, gold? Man, I'd really like that armor. Hey boss, they've got food as well. Shut up, be cool. Hey, 
why don't you let us guide you through this narrow gorge? We're not gonna kill you or nothing. Just walk right on through there. We're not gonna kill you. It's just right this way. We're not gonna kill you. Hannibal's army <laughs> were forced to fight their way through the gorge as massive boulders rained down on them from above. Some clever organization of his line helped them survive. And, and what's your reward if you survive all of this? You're in the middle of Roman territory with the Alps at your back and nowhere to escape but to go forward. They were able to fend off the opportunistic tribes, but losses from the constant attacks were heavy. As the journey continued, men who went over the sides would get stuck on the ice sheets below and had to make a grisly choice between starving to death or just getting it over with. When the deeply demoralized army reached the summit and rested for a couple days, Hannibal tried to lift their spirits with a rousing speech. Look, men, down there, it's Rome. These plains stretching out in front of you are bountiful with food to eat and Romans to kill. Move, Bessie. Look, you have just climbed the walls of Rome. The hard part is over. From here on out, it's all downhill and nobody else will die. Except for them. The rest of us here, no one dies. Starting now. Okay, let's go. Oh, for goodness oh, sake! As it turned out, the descent was as deadly as the way up. With the cold really starting to set in, mm. the path became even more narrow. And at one point, the men spent three days in the freezing cold, repairing a collapsed road. When they finally reached the bottom, Hannibal said, Look, guys, we did it. Oh. Well, I thought it went really well. When Hannibal left Spain, he had about 100,000 men. By the time he reached the Italian plains, his numbers had dwindled to about 26,000. He was now caught in enemy territory without a supply line or source of reinforcements. And this is why if you're Scipio, you wait. You let Mother Nature deal with all of that, and then you just deal with whoever's left. It's, the, it's definitely the right move. And any elephants who had survived to this point were almost certainly traumatized. So what on earth was Hannibal up to? This supposed military genius had just led a starving and weakened army right into enemy territory. Yep. Any modern general who lost half their men to mountains would be immediately fired and possibly even depensed on live TV. Here's the thing. While Hannibal may not have planned on losing quite so many men, he had almost certainly expected he considerable had to. losses. Had to. And he always had a plan for how to replace them. Need men? Northern Italy was full of men big burly Celtic men, all the men Hannibal would ever need to beat off Rome. These Celts were filled with resentment. I will never unsee that. Having only recently been conquered by Rome, <laughs> Hannibal hoped to be seen as a liberator. There comes your political knowledge and your understanding of complicated cultural s situations, but it all depends on getting them on your side. And that's no guarantee. Robert E. Lee marched into Maryland on his way to Pennsylvania uh, twice. He went to Maryland once, and then he goes up into Pennsylvania the second time. And when he was marching into Maryland, he was hoping he was hoping that by marching into Maryland, that all of these people who were sympathizing with his side would rise up, and he'd suddenly have this massive force, and it just didn't happen. So it's a risk. It's a calculated risk, but it is a risk. Convince the Celts to cut ties with Rome. And instead, join him in crushing Rome. That way, he could gain a source of reinforcements and supplies right in Rome's backyard. Makes sense. But sir, in order to win the loyalty of the Celts, we would need to make a seriously favorable impression on them. How do we get him to like us? Hmm. Kill them. One of Hannibal's first actions in Italy was to obliterate a nearby tribe who wouldn't join him. This sent a, Send a message. message to all the yep. other tribes. It was hit. <laughs> join or die. So you hate the Romans who conquered you. Well, you're going to hate me too. So you might as well join my side. His wrath they should fear, not Rome's. The realization that a Carthaginian army had just invaded them must have been shocking for the Romans. Yeah. But when they looked at this ragtag group broken by the Alps, they couldn't have felt very intimidated. However, Hannibal was now in Italy and he was about to embark on one of the most astonishing military campaigns in all of human history. 
The Romans may not have known it yet, but there was now a monster loose in their territory, and he was vying for Roman blood. Oh, that was a good setup for the campaign itself for part two. This is a three-parter. I believe he said part two is ready to come out. It looks like it's out now, so we'll do this tomorrow. We'll do part two. I think part three he's just now working on, so we might be waiting a little while on that one. Uh, but fantastic job, as always. And like I said, please, 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 let's make sure we're supporting our original content creators. Don't just substitute watching his video for watching this one and we'll be back with part two watch part two ahead of time then come back tomorrow for uh, my reaction to it thanks for watching we'll see you again soon